Right, we got a dinner in gear, dog, and towed singer. And that's a Holland coming to Summon Castle. Talking like a foil of good past with a roller of foot broad. When that April with its shore suit, the drought of March hath pierced to the root. And speaking of piercing to the root, what in the world have I been saying in this speech? <laughs> At first, you probably wondered why I didn't clear my throat before I walked up onto the stage. But as I continued, things became eerily familiar until you could understand the gist of what I was saying. And now, well, now you can understand me perfectly, or at least I hope so. What you heard in that introduction was an abbreviated history of the English language. I started with the opening lines of Beowulf, then a sermon from the 12th century and a cooking text from the 15th, and I finished off with the opening lines of the Canterbury Tales. In this speech, we will be tracing the evolution of our language from that first unintelligible sentence to the same thing I'm speaking right now, the same language that over two billion people use every single day for communication, the same language that 50% of the internet is written in, and the same language that spells kernel, C-O-L-O-N-E-L. -O -O <laughs> English is confusing. It's spelling haphazard and it's vocabulary dizzying. In this speech, I hope to explain why. But before we get to the actually interesting stuff, I do have to say that unless otherwise stated, all facts, theories, and information in this speech comes from thehistoryofenglish.com. The history of English is the history of England, and we'll pick up our story when the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes sailed across the North Sea from modern-day Denmark to their new home in the British Isles. Through a couple hundred years of intermarriage, they formed a new cultural identity, and by 600 AD, they lived in Angleland and spoke Inglisk, or as we now call it, Old English. Now old, but definitely not simple. In Old English, nouns have three genders and five potential cases. There were seven classes of strong verbs and three classes of weak verbs, all of which were conjugated for number, gender, tense, person, and mood. A rich and complicated language, to say the least. And by 670 AD, a hymn written by the poet Cademum had become the first recorded English literature. But perhaps even more famous is the mythical tale of Beowulf, which is about warriors and mead and ripping off demons' arms with your bare hands or just what you'd expect from a group of warlike Germanic peoples. Oh, and there's a guy in it named Hrothgar. Why can't I be named Hrothgar? <laughs> Anyways, the opening lines are Heights, we gardena in gir dagum thaud singa. You may have understood a few words there, but perhaps not. Anyways, some of our most common words like I, you, he, she, it, food, water, and rather amusingly, all of our vulgarities trace directly back to Old English. These common words compose about 50% of a modern-day conversation. But of course, that begs the question, where did the other 50% come from? And what happened to gendered nouns and conjugated verbs? Well, I'll get to the first question later, but the answer to the second is Vikings. Vikings happened. <laughs> they started raiding in the mid-8th century, but pretty soon, because they were really family men at heart, they launched a full-out invasion, so they could all have their own little cottages on the English seaside. They spoke the Germanic language of Old Norse. And though about a thousand English words trace back to Old Norse, nice words like skin, skull, knife, dirt, kill, and scream, according to linguist John McWhorter for Columbia University, their real influence was on our grammar. You see, when the Vikings learned English, they learned only what was necessary for basic communication. If you really think about it, all they really needed to say was, small monk, give me your gold. <laughs> the combination of this truncated form of the language with the full thing started the slow process of removing case endings and gendered nouns from our language. So I suppose I can thank the Vikings for making my SAT English test just a wee bit simpler. By this point, we're up to around the ninth century, and England has been invaded on four separate occasions. So take a guess as to what the next major influence on English will be. Yep, you guessed it, another invasion. But this time, the invaders were French, so that makes it okay, right? Well, if Wesley and the Princess Bride was only mostly dead, then the Normans were only mostly French. They themselves were descended from Vikings that had settled in the north of France some 200 years earlier. But when William the Conqueror conquered England in 1066, the rural dialect of French that he spoke became the language of the aristocracy. So much so that it would be almost 300 years before a king of England was born that actually spoke English as his native language. 
The Norman French of the aristocrats and English of the peasants continued to develop in parallel for a while, but then a gradual merger and shift to English occurred. And by 1362, English was the language of England, from peasant to prince. By this time, almost all the unnecessary complexities, such as gendered nouns, had dropped out of the language. Combine that with the some 10,000 words that the Normans gave us, and you have a very different tongue. Not old English, but middle English. The Normans gave us wonderful words like beautiful, painter, place, prime, prison, and boot. Oftentimes, both the old English word and the new Norman French word would persist, but with slightly different meanings. Freedom is from the Anglo-Saxon, whereas liberty is from the Norman French. And if you want to hear someone debate the difference between the two of them, you can just head over to a Lincoln Douglas round. <laughs> These couplets of synonyms add nuance and complexity to our language. So much so that according to Oxford English dictionaries, English has a larger vocabulary than either its Germanic or its French roots giving us English speakers a beautiful and diverse palette of words with which to paint. And paint they did. By the 13th century, literature in Middle English had started to flow. Some of the works written around this time were the original translation of the Bible into English by John Wycliffe, and the famous Canterbury Tales. Their opening lines are, When that April with its shore suit, the drought of March hath pierced to the root. I'm guessing for the first time in this speech you can almost understand one of these historical passages. But nonetheless, something is still off. That something is pronunciation. Starting in the 15th century and continuing to the 17th was a complete overhaul of the English pronunciation system that linguists call the Great Vowel Shift. Dirk changed to dark, hurt to heart, leaf to life, thief to five. Why? Well, perhaps it was the plague mixing up people's regional accents or the influence of Norman French words. Or perhaps it was little green men. The fact of the matter is, no one really knows. Sometimes the spelling changed to reflect the new pronunciation, and unfortunately for all of us, sometimes it didn't. By this point, we're up to the 16th century, and the Renaissance is well underway. Words for new abstract concepts are being lifted straight out of Latin and plopped into English. Words like fact, crisis, pungent, explain, and comedy. One of the biggest innovators in this department was William Shakespeare. Almost 2,000 words and neologisms appear for the first time in his works. The lovely sentence, his critical eyeballs made me puke, so I dwindled laughably, would not have been possible without the linguistic contributions of William Shakespeare. <laughs> but your average citizen knew nothing of these newfangled words. Literacy was not common. But that all changed when William Caxton introduced the printing press. Now books and new words with them could be printed and freely distributed. But when printing started, English was far from standardized. There were five major dialects, and spelling was even more erratic. To give you a taste, in literature around this time, historians have discovered over 500 different spellings of the word though. That's an awful lot of different spellings. But over time, one random spelling of a word would win out, leaving us with the logical and ordered system of spelling that we still deal with to this day. Printed English also served to standardize spoken English. Some early printers decided to use the northern form of they, there, and them, rather than the more common London form of hi, here, and hem. As people became literate, the more common London form simply fell out of usage. Now, up to this point, the pace of change has been breakneck. If you wanted to tweak the grammar or the pronunciation, hey, who was going to stop you? But when literacy is common, a specific form of the language is written down and deemed correct. The impact is huge. I can easily read things written by William Shakespeare some 400 years ago, but he couldn't read a word of Old English written 400 years before him. Since the Victorian ages, the language has shifted slightly in grammar and pronunciation, but it remains largely the same. What is different, though, is that now English is spoken the world over and is a language of international trade, diplomacy, and science. But then again, let's not let all of that go to our heads. I mean, when was the last time you actually heard someone say whom in an everyday conversation? Hello, sir, is no more fundamentally linguistically correct than what's up, dog, or the Jamaican wagwan. In the 17th century, something that was nice was ingratiating. In the 70s, it was far out. And today, it might just be on fleek. 
And you know what? That's okay. The only constant in the history of English has been change. And if it is to remain relevant, we all need to accept that. It's been a long way getting from white we gardena to like, let me take a selfie. <laughs> but I think it's been an interesting journey. So the next time you find yourself confounded by English spelling or vocabulary, you might just be tempted to let a few old English-based vulgarities fly. But also try to remember, just try to remember the history that hides behind every single word. Thank you.